involved with RSN for nearly 15 years. Support from someone who's been there makes all the difference. Hey David, what are you listening to? Kidney Talk, an online radio podcast that talks about kidney disease and the prevention of it. Oh cool, where can I find that? Oh, you can download it on iHeartRadio, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. Oh nice, I'll definitely have to download that. Shout out to Renal Support Network, the annual Renal Support Network essay contest. I won the Renal Support Network contest last year, the Warrior and we are all warriors. So thank you, thank you. Keep on doing all that you do and um, be happy and healthy and keep the hope. Thank you, Renal Support Network, woohoo! As a kidney transplant recipient, I find that having an actual publication like Kidney Talk is an invaluable resource for any kidney warrior at any stage. me informed of kidney advocacy issues so my voice can be heard. I'm really looking forward to the prom this year and meeting people who are just like me. Dressing up is super fun and all the activities are amazing. Can't wait to see you there! participating in the Renal Support Network 30-minute fitness Zoom classes. Not only have I lost 15 pounds, but I can also strike a yoga pose like this. When I created Renal Support Network back in 1993, I had no idea the impact that I would have among my peers. An illness is too demanding when you don't have hope, and peer support, education, and knowledge are crucial to our survival. We have a great week planned with some incredible speakers, uh, great uh, information for you to share, learn, so we can survive and thrive with this illness. It's imperative. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to have a great event, and a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen. It's my pleasure to introduce Lubna Akbani. Um, Lubna Akbani, I've known her for many years and um, she's uh, come to many of our meetings and, and she was a renal care professional at first when I met her. And then when we started talking, she says, well, I have a kidney transplant too. And she's a, a renal dietitian. She's phenomenally wonderful in motivating and educating and teaching people about how to, to um, utilize the correct diet for their stage of kidney disease. She also does private consultation uh, via Zoom, and it's my pleasure to introduce Lubna. Thank you so much, Lori. I do appreciate being invited by the RSN uh, group, and especially Lori. Yes, I have known you for several years, and uh, uh, we've always uh, hit it off uh, right from day one. Um, anyways, uh, without further ado, I would like to go ahead, share my screen, and uh, I believe I can go ahead and start. <clears throat> can everybody see my screen? We can. So why don't you go to play from start Perfect. so we can see them. And... Uh, right. Perfect. And you have some great information. So um, we're a little <laughs> bit late, but please, uh, if you could go for like 35 minutes sure. or so, that would be wonderful. I'll try my best. <laughs> I know. You have some great information. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, but we'll make it work. You do what you need to do. All right. I'll try and speak as fast as I can. But if you need me to slow down, please uh, raise your hand and uh, I'll start going slower then. All right, so we are going to talk about nutrition issues in transplant today. Um, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about three different phases, the pre-transplant nutrition management, the acute phase right after you've had your transplant, and then we'll talk about the long-term transplant nutrition management, okay? 
so uh, nutrition concerns pre-transplant, let's go through, uh, of course, the first thing is malnutrition. Whether you have obesity or underweight, this can be of concern. A lot of people who are overweight uh, or have obesity are still considered to be malnourished because they choose the wrong kind of foods. Besides the renal diet or the diet on dialysis is so, so restrictive that uh, you know, we tend to have uh, malnutrition in patients who are on dialysis or who are pre-dialysis pre -dial pre patients as well because uh, they are uh, on a very restrictive diet. The other concern uh, before we get transplanted is the edema issue or the ascites issue if you have liver, liver problems along with kidney problems that are going on. And we all know that that can be a big uh, uh, problem for transplant. It also uh, shows uh, the transplant team that maybe you are not very compliant with your fluid restriction. And so that is why as a dialysis dietitian, I always um, emphasize that uh, following your diet, following the restrictions that have been um, explained to the patient be followed at all times. Uh, another risk uh, or nutrition concern is the dyslipidemia uh, that comes along with uh, proteinuria uh, in dialysis patients or pre-dialysis patients um, where you have a very uh, the profile of your lipids is very skewed because your albumin tends to uh, run low and uh, it's the albumin that holds cholesterol and the lipids in its place. With albumin being so low, you could have that dyslipidemia be very prominent both in the dialysis phase as well as pre-dialysis phase. Um, we also know that there are electrolyte and mineral imbalances the renal osteodystrophy because of the calcium phosphorus and the PTH being uh, off, uh, you know, off skew, uh, hypoparathyroidism, and then of course diabetes causes another full ball ballpark of uh, problems that comes with it. So what are we going to discuss today is basically what is healthy weight for transplant? We've heard of this a lot healthy weight, healthy weight, healthy weight. So we'll go and dwell a little bit on that. Then we will go ahead and tackle what is a healthy diet. And then in the long term, we will talk about what, is the, what, is, uh, what are the challenges that we face long term with transplant. And then we'll try to tackle some of the food safety issues as well. So what is a good weight for transplant? We always talk about BMI or body mass index. What is body mass index? It is basically the measure of body fat uh, based on the ratio of your height to weight. So there are three categories or four categories that we put our patients under. Um, we say if you're less than 18.5, then you're, if your BMI is less than 18.5, you are underweight. The normal BMI is 18.5 to 24.9. Overweight is 24.9 to 29.9. And anything above 30 of a BMI is considered obese. So what are the implications of having, uh, of being underweight at the time of transplant? This may indicate some compromised nutritional status, um, hypoalbuminemia, as I mentioned before, uh, could be due to inadequate intake of albumin or proteins because the patient is feeling so um, underdialyzed or has the problem of being tired after dialysis. And so we try to tackle that. Um, and then, of course, it is also being underweight is a, pre, is a very powerful pred predictor of morbidity and mortality, which means that uh, it could be detrimental for somebody who is very underweight to have a transplant. Obesity, on the other hand, increases metabolic work on all your organs. And this may pose difficulty for transplant patients because it may have a result, it may result in a delayed graft function, or it may uh, increase the length of stay in the hospital delayed wound healing because of all those fat layers that are present. 
um, decreased overall graft survival, and of course the increased risk of having um, new onset of, di of diabetes after transplant. Um, there's also increased complexity because of obesity, there's, uh, there's uh, increased complexity of the surgery itself. Healthy weight for transplant. So the best transplant outcomes are in the BMI between 18.5 to approximately 27. Nowadays, they're saying that if you are a little plump, it actually helps protect your kidney to a certain extent. This BMI range is, uh, is associated with better transplant survival rate, decreased risk of infection, uh, decreased ICU uh, days or overall hospital uh, length of stay, and uh, decreased risk of, de of developing um, diabetes post-transplant. So that being said, let's go into a healthy diet. What is a healthy diet? Um, so let's tackle a little bit about the acute stage after a transplant. Um, protein catabolism is, uh, is a very big factor in these uh, post-transplant uh, post days. Uh, what ends up happening is because of the trauma that, has, that is caused by the surgery, that you tend to have uh, a higher rate at which the protein gets uh, it gets broken down. Uh, fluid and electrolyte imbalance is another uh, post-transplant uh, acute phase that we are facing. Uh, nutrient, uh, drug-nutrient interactions, because there are so many new drugs that you are put on to bring your immunity down to, uh, you're put on prednisone, you're put on Imuran, you're put on <clears throat> different kind of uh, 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 immunity, immune suppressants, that can cause a concern for your nutrition at that time. And of course, there, we have some um, uh, um, um, we have had some evidence that uh, with post-transplant, there is some, in some cases, there is onset of uh, newly, newly diagnosed diabetics because of some of these uh, medications that uh, post-transplant patients have to take. So uh, proteins during that acute phase, we generally uh, uh, calculate the protein intake to be anywhere between 1.3 to 2 grams per kg body weight. Now that is either the dry weight of the patient or uh, the adjusted weight, depending on which one is uh, greater or lower. Uh, carbohydrates, again, 50 to 60% of, uh, of your calories should come from carbohydrate sources. Um, and we uh, use the Harris-Benedict uh, formula to come up with approximately 30 to 35 kcals per kg body weight, adjusted body weight. And then again, for the fat, we would follow the uh, Center for um, uh, Disease Protect uh, 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 Prevention recommended levels for fat, which would minimize the cardiovascular risk factors. So uh, uh, we take about 10% to 15% of fat uh, calories, uh, and then if you are obese, then we go further uh, down on that. Again, uh, the sodium doesn't generally change. We like to keep it less than uh, 200, 2,000 milligrams or 2 grams so that we can manage the blood pressure and the fluid balance. Uh, with some immunosuppressants, your potassiums can go high, and we'll go a little bit more into that uh, in a couple of slides. So we, we do want to keep your, uh, an eye on the potassium. If the potassiums are low, we do liberalize the potassium diet. But then if we see that you do have some high potassiums, we would continue to keep your potassium levels between two and four grams per day. Generally speaking, post-transplant, we have seen that phosphorus levels go very low. Uh, you see a lot of hypophosphatemia because the new kidney checks in and uh, it starts to pull out a lot of phosphorus as well as magnesium because of urinary losses. Suddenly, may, you may not have had urine for a very long time. You may have just some very low urine output. And now with the new kidney coming in, your urinary uh, uh, 
losses start to come up because you start having more urine output, which is a great thing. And uh, for people who have been on dialysis and who have been on a very, very restrictive diet for a very long time, especially with phosphorus, phosphorus, it opens out a lot of new avenues. Uh, to tell you the truth that sometimes post-transplant, we have actually had patients uh, have uh, Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola to bring up their phosphorus levels. So all the time that you've been told, don't, 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 suddenly these avenues open up for you. Uh, vitamins, uh, we continue to give you this, uh, the renal specific vitamins initially, but, and we tell you to avoid the vitamin C because we don't want a very high load on the new kidney. Uh, trace minerals, again, the iron is, it continues if you have the uh, anemia. In the initial stages, we do continue it, but as you go on and you stabilize on that transplant, uh, the anemia resolves and you don't have to take those iron supplements anymore. Uh, we also ask you to have some zinc supplementation initially, just so that it helps with wound healing post-transplant. Now, um, how do you get these foods into your um, diet? So consuming a variety of foods from all the six food groups every day is what we emphasize on. And again, uh, getting your phosphorus and magnesium back into shape is so we uh, generally liberalize the diet on phosphorus and magnesium. Um, we recommend that you get these, uh, grain, these uh, uh, variety from grains, fruits, vegetables, meats, dairy, and other uh, sources. And we will go into that in a couple uh, of slides. Um, a carbohydrate pattern, uh, generally speaking, is to be maintained. Uh, we uh, suggest or recommend that you have three meals and two snacks and have it consistently at the same time so that at no point you have a surge of sugar. Uh, we also recommend that you limit your saturated fats, so avoid fried foods. Choose more foods that are baked or broiled or grilled, uh, steamed or poached rather than fried foods. Uh, avoid salt intake because we want to stabilize your uh, blood pressure as well as your um, um, uh, fluid intake, right? So your, um, we want to stabilize all that. So we, we want to continue uh, keeping that salt intake low. So then limited uh, processed foods again with that salt limitation. And then we would recommend you to increase the soluble fiber or insoluble fiber in your diet the goal being 25 to 35 grams daily. All right, so uh, what kind of grains can I eat is a question that comes up a lot of times. And uh, we say to consume whole grains because from that whole grain, you get a lot of natural fiber and a lot of, uh, a lot of the vitamins and the minerals are underneath that fiber. And so eating more of the whole grain uh, whole grain breads, pastas, rice, like uh, wheat, wheat bread or a multigrain bread, um, uh, whole grain cereals, whole uh, brown rice versus white rice is preferred. Um, it is proven that uh, these kind of whole grains uh, reduce the risk of heart disease as well as diabetes and uh, also help in uh, regulating and maintaining your weight. Um, so when you uh, are purchasing these items, look for the word whole in your ingredient list on your food label. So like, for example, I said whole grains, whole wheat, whole rice, or uh, you know, whole, uh, brown rice, whole oats. These are some of the things that you would like to incorporate. Fruits and vegetables. Um, they are very high in B-complex vitamins. They, are, they give you a lot of minerals and have both soluble and uh, insoluble fiber. Uh, they are very low in calories. And so we suggest or recommend that you have at least five servings of fruits and vegetables every single day. Choose uh, fruits and vegetables that are either fresh or frozen and avoid those that come in cans because uh, they could be either too, too high in salt or too, too high in sugar if you're getting the fruits. Um, 
with no, lower nutrient levels because they have they lose a lot of their nutrients when they are being canned during the canning process. Uh, another suggestion is to vary your fruits and vegetables and incorporate as many colors in them as possible because these colorful vegetables and fruits have a lot of antioxidants and they are beneficial to you because they are able to keep that to um, to keep the uh, cancerous forming uh, uh, elements down with the antioxidants. Next, we talk about meat and meat substitutes. Uh, the primary source, uh, these are the primary source of protein in your diet. Uh, the proteins from meats and eggs are 100% consumed by the body or absorbed by the body versus proteins that are coming from vegetarian sources like beans and nuts and uh, cereal um, are about 60% absorbed. And if uh, some of you were on, uh, on the first day of uh, Hope Week, we had uh, Dr. Kalantar talk, talk to us about how uh, beneficial the vegetarian protein is in the health of the kidney. Post-transplant as well, we would try to keep uh, at least 50% of the um, Di uh, of the protein consumption from plant-based sources and the other 50% uh, from any of your choice uh, uh, meat or meat substitutes. Um, again, uh, choose from uh, beans, nuts, whole grains as much as possible. Choose lean cuts of proteins, poultry um, and fish. Um, trim any kind of visible fat that is uh, on the meat before you cook it. And again, choose uh, the options of either broiling or grilling the meat or baking the meat instead of frying the meat. Dairy, again, the, uh, you, it's a very good source of uh, calcium, riboflavin, and of protein. It's a complete uh, food, uh, uh, so to speak. And uh, we recommend that you uh, consume at least two servings, at least two servings per day, okay? Uh, choose from the non-fat or the reduced fat dairy products, including meat, cheese, and yogurt. Oils and other discretionary uh, calories would come from examples are oil, butter, cakes, cookies, candy, sodas. Um, now, again, uh, these are usually high in calories and very low in nutrients. They are empty calories is what we call them. Uh, we also refer to them sometimes as uh, junk food. Um, so the recommendation with that is to use this sparingly, uh, get most of the fat uh, from, you know, uh, try to get these from uh, olive oil or canola oil instead of butter. Try, if you're using margarine, uh, look up margarines that have zero trans fats. These are the beneficial kinds of uh, fats that you can incorporate in your diet. Um, so... Getting into the long-term uh, management of the disease. So now uh, what ends up happening with this is, um, did you gain weight after transplant? That is, uh, that is something that happens inevitably. So you are not alone. Excessive weight gain is very common after receiving a transplant. And uh, it has an effect on almost two thirds of the kidney transplant patients. So post-transplant weight gain is very, very common, not only with kidney transplant patients, but other solid organ transplant patients also gain weight. And what ends up happening is after receiving a new kidney, um, you naturally look forward to that freedom, right, from the restrictive diet that you have been following for such a long time while you were waiting for that transplant. So... On the renal diet, for example, there are so many no's that you have been following that suddenly you have this new array of foods that have opened up to you and you want to, of course, eat them all because you want to enjoy them. But um, to preserve your, your kidney function, the good way would be uh, to have everything in moderation. Moderation is the key. Okay, as you feel better with your transplant, you may also be struck with a better appetite because now um, you're not feeling as sick, you're feeling better. 
not just that the appetite returns because you're feeling better, but the prednisone that you are on can also uh, make you, the steroids generally make you more hungry. So, you know, making um, better choices of food is always a good, uh, healthy way of looking at it. All right. Um, now that, you know, you have all these things going your way, um, I would advise uh, anybody to now start looking at healthier way of eating and uh, to be a little more conscious so as not to bring on um, other metabolic syndromes uh, because of weight gain. But like I said, excessive weight gain is inevitable. A lot of us, like two thirds of us do experience it. And so let's get on and see what happens with the new onset diabetes after transplant. Um, so, like I mentioned, the uh, steroids uh, can cause you to gain weight because it, uh, uh, you know, it, it opens up your appetite. So let's see what some of the effects of the transplant medications have on your diet. Uh, Celsept causes you to have diarrhea or constipation sometimes. There's a lot of nausea and vomiting that comes on board with the, with the initial um, uh, taking of uh, Celsep. So we generally suggest that you take small frequent feedings so that you can better tolerate this medication. Instead of large meals, small frequent feedings helps tolerate, uh, uh, helps with tolerance of uh, Celsep. Uh, Prograft or Tacrolimus, on the other hand, is the culprit in a way because it increases blood sugar levels, and it, as it decreases the pancreas insulin production uh, level. And so in the long term, this is what generally happens is that the prograft and the Celsep and the cyclosporine, all these in combination with the steroids make you have higher glucose levels. And that's how you tend to end up with um, diabetes post transplant Okay. Um, so how do we manage this? How do we manage diabetes post-transplant? Again, we go back to the three major fuel nutrients in our food, back to carbohydrates, protein, fat. Now, 100% of the carbohydrates that you eat gets broken down into glucose. And so it does have an effect on your blood glucose levels versus only 20% of the proteins that you eat get broken down into blood glucose. And so it has a lesser uh, effect or a smaller effect on your blood glucose levels. And it, it prevents those spikes from happening. And then the fat, obviously, fat remains fat in the body. And so it has a smaller effect on that, on your blood glucose, very, very small effect on the blood glucose. Um, and it ha also has a delayed effect on your blood glucose. Now, what are the carbohydrate sources? Back to the basics, bread, rice, cereal, grains, fruit, milk, any kind of starchy vegetables like corn, peas, potatoes, beans, all of these are considered carbohydrate sources. Now, each serving of these, uh, for the bread and the grain, it's generally a third cup, uh, one slice or one slice of bread, a third cup of rice, um, a third cup, uh, two, three fourth cup of cereal. This is what translates into 15 grams of carbohydrate. Each serving of carbohydrate gives you approximately 15 grams of carbohydrates. So each of the serving give, uh, translates into um, glucose. Okay. The recommendation is to eat three meals a day and have them at the same time so that there's no spikes in your blood sugars. It's very important that a diabetic eat meals at the same time every single day and approximately the same amount of food every single day. Uh, you, have, you should include uh, a, the same amount of carbohydrate in each meal so that no meal spikes up your sugar in the blood. So for a woman, for example, uh, three to four servings per meal. And for men, it's about four to five servings per meal. Eat your protein and carbohydrate in combination of your meal and snacks. 
stay active. Uh, additional expenditure reduces glucose levels. So we know that when we are exercising, we are using up the glucose that is building up in the blood. Um, so the next thing we are going to get into is food safety. So like I said, immunosuppressive drugs are used in high quantities so that we prevent organ rejection. This in turn weakens your immune system and gives you, uh, and it's also makes it very hard for you to fight off infections. So uh, practicing good safety measures is helpful to reduce um, or to decrease the risk of developing foodborne illnesses. Okay, the recommendation is, again, just basic recommendations that we are following today in the COVID world. Wash your hands frequently. Wash your hands before preparing your meals, before eating and after eating your food. Wash your raw fruits and vegetables thoroughly in cold running water. Never thaw food at room temperature. Instead, thaw it at, in the refrigerator, in the microwave, or while cooking. Avoid cross-contamination. So again, if you're dealing with different kinds of foods, wash in between, cutting, um, uh, in between cutting the different meats, use different cutting boards, different knives. Washing the countertop with hot soapy water is very important. And again, before, uh, you know, after you've prepared, especially raw, raw meat, poultry and fish, washing everything with hot water is, uh, hot soapy water is recommended. So for food safety, we have to keep in, in um, mind what the temperature zones are. The danger temperature zone is 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when food spoils the fastest. So safe cooking temperature for beef, lamb, steaks, roast is 145 degrees Fahrenheit. For fish is also 145 degrees Fahrenheit. For pork is a little higher so that we can get rid of the bacteria that grow in it, the trichinosis. Um, so pork is 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Ground meat is also 160 degrees Fahrenheit because, it's, uh, because of the ground meat, it has more surface area and it, uh, the bacteria can grow faster on it. And turkey, chicken uh, also has like, go up to 165 is recommended. Storage time, um, storing everything in the refrigerator, again, for fish, chicken, um, shellfish, ground meat, it's about one to two days. Leftovers, leftover food, don't eat more than three to four days uh, old leftover food. Uh, fresh beef, uh, veal, lamb, and roast can be, uh, can be kept in the refrigerator for three to four days. Uh, lunch meats, anywhere from three to, four, three to five days after opening the package. Uh, fresh eggs, in shell, three to five weeks. Uh, in the freezer, things can stay for a little longer. Bacon, sausage, ham, lunch meats can stay for about one to two months. But again, we are not trying to consume any of these foods because they're very high in sodium and they are processed foods. Soups and stews, two to three months. Uh, frozen dinners, three to four months. Uncooked fresh meats, four to 12 months. Eggs and egg substitutes, anyway. uh, again, if they're in the freezer for about now we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about herbal supplements and food safety. Herbal supplements are not recommended because they're not standardized in the United States. It's not regulated by the FDA like other prescription drugs and uh, medications. Um, the concentration of the active ingredient in this is very inconsistent. And that is why with transplanter springs, we must avoid Again, I can't uh, stress enough, we must avoid herbal medications, herbal uh, supplements as much as possible. The following herbs are not safe to be used by uh, transplant recipients. Grapefruit seed extract, alpha alpha, black cohosh, um, St. John's wort, red clover, licorice root, red yeast rice, uh, again, just licorice by itself, green tea, chamomile tea. Uh, we, we think all these are so benign, but actually for a transplant recipient, these are very, very detrimental. It can actually have a very bad effect. And you can, in, it, because if these do not get out of your system, 
fast enough, these can cause you to lose your craft. And we are not trying to do that at any point. Now, nutrition uh, issues long-term post-transplant is, of course, as we talked, dyslipidemia can occur, obesity and weight gain. We have seen that happens because of all the medications that we have put on. New onset diabetes after transplant is a big, big uh, um, cause. Um, uh, progression of renal disease. So whatever disease you had initially, especially with the IgA, IgM kind of diseases, they can come back uh, in the new kidney and that can affect the long-term post-transplant management as well. Uh, and again, foodborne and infectious complications. And these are some of the references that I have used to come up with this. Now I would like to recap uh, some of the things that uh, we are trying to attain. Uh, so gaining weight after transplant, like we said, um, is, uh, is very bad. So we have to um, keep these long-term diseases in, in, uh, in our, in our uh, day-to-day lives and try to prevent them. So type 2 diabetes, for example, can happen because of the long-term use of uh, prednisone and uh, the weight gain can cause it. So again, keeping all that uh, food intake in, in control is very, very important. Um, gout, uh, again, keep an eye on your purine intake. Red meats are very high in purines and gout can cause your new graft to fail. Um, you know, so we have to keep an eye on these kind of things. Uh, my suggestion would be, again, talking to your uh, team and uh, consulting even post-transplant. For the first three years, you, do, you can um, have a consult with a with the dietitian to keep you on track, uh, and it is paid by Medicare. So don't, don't feel shy. Ask your doctor for a referral if you need that help, if you need the sustain, sustenance, um, okay? Um, doing so will help you manage your food and your health status. Uh, staying away from fad diets. I cannot uh, uh, emphasize enough on these fad diets. Keto diet, for example, is a very, very high protein diet, and that can put an extra load on that graft, on that kidney, and you can be putting yourself at risk of a graft failure by, by consuming that high quantities of uh, proteins for, with the keto diet. Uh, I, didn't stress, I didn't talk about... Uh, um, exercise. Uh, incorporate exercise to uh, at least 35 to 45, 30 to 45 minutes daily, five days a week, to be able to manage that uh, extra calories that kind of pile on. Um, and, uh, you know, that will help uh, not only manage your weight, but also uh, be able to, in, you know, uh, utilize the extra sugars uh, that, that are in the blood and uh, help you manage your weight and uh, the diabetes, okay? Uh, when you go out to do your grocery shopping, try your hardest to resist temptation. I know those aisles are very inviting with the, and you have been on a very restrictive diet prior to transplant. And so now it opens up all these new avenues and you get tempted, but please keep your temptations under control. That will help you that willpower will keep your graft going for a longer period of time. Drink plenty of fluids. Flu keeping those kidneys flushed at all times is very, very important. Uh, keep, you know, if you uh, most doctors uh, have uh, asked for, uh, ask you to drink at least two to three liters of water daily to keep your uh, kidneys flushed out. Um, look for healthier ways to uh, cook your meats and cook your food. Uh, pay attention to portion sizes. Portion sizes are very, very, very important to keep your caloric intake down. Uh, half of your plate should be full of vegetables as much as possible. Cooked or raw, doesn't matter. Uh, but try to eat more vegetables because that way you'll get more fiber in your diet and it will uh, help you um, manage your uh, weight very well. Don't forget to read your food labels. The food label guidelines remain the same whether you are on dialysis or off dialysis, monitor the amount of sodium you're eating, don't add extra salt to your food, and uh, watch out for interactions. Uh, 
one more thing, Lori, before I go. Grapefruit juice. I have some questions juice. for you. I have some questions for you. So oh, gonna... okay. All right. Let's go for the questions. What, what, tell about grapefruit juice. It's not, not good for you. I know that. Yeah. Grapefruit juice and star fruit. These are the two things that you need to man, uh, monitor. Well, in grapefruit, what's interesting is that it, it, it interacts with your transplant meds and makes your levels higher. Exactly. So um, a couple questions that we're going to move to Mark Meyer, and I appreciate you did a fabulous job. Um, Thank you. You know, so much information, and I just don't like the information you give on starch <laughs> and carbohydrates. I still think bread is its own food group, okay? <laughs> I agree with you, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's nothing better than rye bread or sourdough bread or coming out of the oven. I mean, oh my God, it's just too much. But um, I will say that once you have a transplant, your taste bud changes because when you're on dialysis, you, you have just a little different taste. And so I found myself having to spice stuff up and stuff like that. And, and then when you're transplanted, it, your taste changes a little bit. So, uh, but yes, food is good. <laughs> Um, so is there something to timing certain foods, fruits before a meal, carbs in the a.m. versus p.m.? Uh, I don't practice that way. Um, I just say that having, uh, having uh, fruits that are low in carbohydrates, low calorie fruits like apples, oranges uh, are better for you, pears, than eating the bananas and things like that because those are calorie dense. You can continue to have those but in smaller portions. Um, I hope I'm answering the question, question correctly. <laughs> well, I, um, yeah, Joanna had that, that a question. And then another one is in lay terms to get 50% of protein from plants. Would you re recommend half the week? The main protein of the day should be veggies. Um, I have a protein with each day. I'm trying to answer that right. So I guess what the question is, is um, would a general rule to try to get half of your protein from plant-based if you're not vegan, vegetarian? Correct. That is very right. That is true because um, like I said, only 60% of the protein that is coming from the vegetarian sources are absorbed by the body. And so we are better off uh, not overtaxing our bodies with uh, animal protein. Uh, and that's exactly what Dr. Kalantar was saying the other day is that we should uh, try to incorporate uh, vegetarian proteins uh, in our diets as much as possible and stay away from animal proteins because not only are they 100% absorbed by the body, but they put an extra load on the GI system because they are very acidic, stay in the stomach longer, as well as they put a higher load of uh, creatinine and byproducts on the kidney. So yes, 50% of the protein should still come from plant-based sources. Um, okay, I, I think I know this one. With stage five CKD, not on dialysis, are whole eggs okay or egg whites better? And I think I can uh, answer this one, but I'm gonna let you answer it. Okay, so uh, whole, egg is, uh, whole egg is better. Eileen, Eileen. Actually, eggs, eggs in general, it is the, pr the protein is in the white. So, uh, you know, if not you are on a low protein not diet, part, the yellow part, <laughs> the yellow, the yellow part has all the cholesterol and the fat and the vitamins and minerals, <laughs> and the protein is all in the white. So it, uh, if if it is, you can have one egg four times a week uh, on a stage five, but that takes away one ounce of protein from your three to four ounces that you're allowed in stage five. Okay, and then, um, I'm sorry, I'm not even highlighting you, sorry. Uh, and then the last two are together. Um, somebody says no green tea post-transplant. I have not heard of that. Um, and how about black tea? And then the other one is CB, is, is licorice bad for transplant? Yes. Um, I love good and plenty. I love good and plenty too. So uh, we'll, we'll end it there. And uh, if you can answer those, um, that would be so, great. Yes, green tea, because again, it depends on what kind of green tea it is. Uh, it could be uh, from an herb, it could, but black tea is okay to consume, there's no problem. Licorice still poses a, uh, um, 
a negative effect on the transplanted kidney. So please don't take any licorice. Um, uh, green tea, again, make sure it is just from the regular tea tea and not an herb tea like chamomile or anything like that. All right. Thank you so much, Lubna. You did You're an very awesome welcome. job. Um, Thank you. you always give so much information and uh, Lubna is frequently a guest on RSNs, uh, a different, different ways we communicate. So please make, a, a, when you see your name, um, please uh, join us, have a discussion and um, we'll, uh, we'll see you soon, Lubna. All right. Thank you so much for having me again, Lori. I really appreciate this. And it's, uh, I always enjoy coming on uh, RSN uh, Zoom meetings and uh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for being You're your welcome. flexible. Bye-bye. See you soon. Okay. And a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen.